Good evening. Welcome to The Liquid Antiquarian, a show uh, that is presented, um, researched, in fact, most importantly, researched by myself, Arthur Motley, and Dave Broom, an old friend. We both work in the booze trade, but as a hobby, because we are not professional historians, we are antiquarians, we like to root around archives to find grand stories that need retelling or small stories that have never been told. And this might be about culture or people, eccentrics, places. Uh, but this one is slightly more technical. It's about the development of the equipment uh, that spirits are made on, stills, effectively. But that shapes how they taste. Um, and you, so you will learn why the spirits in your glass taste like they do, partly because of the equipment and the inventions over time. And talking about the spirits in our glass, tonight, I am really happy to uh, announce we have our first uh, sponsor, uh, support from the Thompson Brothers of Dorlock. So, um, and really, this is an advertising because they do not need help selling their whiskey. Uh, if I can just tell you a little bit about them. Uh, they are based off in Dornoch. Their family have a hotel uh, with a restaurant and a very fine whiskey bar. It is hard to argue against it being the best rare whiskey bar in Scotland. But then they got into independent bottlings. And although these guys are young, they are not funky and trendy, but their bottles really are. Uh, each bottle individually um, has a label designed by a local artist called Katie. And these are wildly successful, very well chosen. And then this year is a special year because this is the year that the whiskey that they have distilled, so they also turn distillers. This is the year that their whiskey turns three years old and could be called whiskey. And don't try and buy it because that's also sold out. But they are wonderful guys and they have shown really great early support. It was a great uh, show of confidence for the liquid antiquarian. If we can keep whiskey geeks like them happy and they want us to continue, then uh, we're doing something right, Dave. So it's a real boost. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, lovely guys. And I'm looking forward to, to this strand, which I'm tricky yes, in an so, antiquarian style glass. You know, so. Ah, very good. Very good. <laughs> so we have um, uh, an Invergordon 1972, uh, bottled as a 48-year-old, single cask, 42%. So it's a single grain whiskey distilled in a column still. And then later, if we remember, we might save this for the after show, but um, uh, we also have a rum bottled by uh, the Thompson Brothers and actually our company, Romar Whiskies. Uh, so this has a chap called Kyle on the front, uh, who is the part owner and bartender at Nauticus. And thoughts go oh, out good. to everyone in the hospitality trade still. Uh, let's, uh, let's see you in your pubs soon. Yeah. So, Dave, so, I know you have been working extremely hard on this with your research. What have you found out? Well, I, I think there are quite a few things, thankfully. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been, it's been uh, absolutely fascinating Uh investigation in, into all the different stills which appeared uh, in the 19th century all around the world. Uh, you know, God, but the print, the print in the 19th century, tiny, 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 tiny point sign. <laughs> uh, so, and I've been kind of wading through uh, rather wonderful uh, accounts of, of various patents and steam driven everything uh, to, to find this. Uh, so hopefully there'll be a couple of revelations. Uh, some of this information is out there, but I don't think it's ever been pulled together to be looked at mm. from a global perspective and from a motivational uh, perspective. So, but big thanks uh, at the very top to, to my dear friend Chris Middleton out there in Australia, who really is the fount of all knowledge. Uh, thank you so much to Chris for all the help he's given me on this, especially uh, at a difficult time for, for him and his family. So uh, thinking of you and the family, Chris, thank you for, for all your help. Uh, so uh, what are we looking at, Arthur? Well, looking at these kind of amazing inventions uh, which kind of took place in the 19th century. And I'm, I'm looking, again, a bit like you did uh, uh, the other night with, with, with the women in whiskey, looking really from the beginning of the 19th century up until about the middle. So that, that was the first 50 years of the 19th century, which was this explosion in new innovations in terms of, of, of distilling, which affected flavor. And this is really important for, 
for today's whiskey drinker, for today's rum drinker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is this is the era when flavour fundamentally shifted. Uh, so it's important uh, to all of us. And I also want to kind of redress the balance uh, or the belief that it kind of all ended with Aeneas Coffee. I mean, it kind of caught, there was nothing before coffee. I, I feel a few people maybe. The Aeneas Coffee suddenly arrives and boom, everything is sorted. Thank you very much. End of story. Not the case at all. Uh, so so well, um, we'll examine I mean, that. I know a bit of... Yeah, I know a bit about whiskey, and when you said I was going to do the development of the stills, I was like, well, pot still, there, there was, pot still, there was steam, that wasn't very good, that was a bit of rubbish, and there was coffee, Yeah, please. everything done. So, oh, yes. <laughs> I, and I've, you've been pinging all these slides to me, and I've been preparing them, and I've been like, wow, never heard of him, wow, never seen that before, and there are some bonkers contraptions I mean, some really bonkers I mean, contraptions uh you know uh not there's a huge selection of patents uh to go through i can't go through every single one it would be incredibly tedious not all of them will appear here not all of the the, the names will appear here so those who are very keen historians on this not everybody's going to be mentioned it's a time thing uh but i i would say that the key ones are here to be able to move the story forward and go into some explanation Maybe with the pointer, or maybe just talking because I can't work out left and right, or especially when it's reversed. Uh, and also some of these more bonkers ones as well. But anyway, uh, to get an idea of what we are going to be doing, the whole talk is moving from our good old pot still. And here is the good old pot still run by, run by a good old distiller. This is from this amazing book called The Art of Distillation, which is published in the 1650s, uh, written by John French. An extraordinary, extraordinary book. If you're interested in, in early distillation, get that. Uh, but moving from the pot still to the column still. So from there on the left to there on the right. That is what we're going to be talking about. But we're going to be taking uh, a couple of interesting different little pathways pathways through this, uh, talking about uh, the very beginnings of it uh, with one particular uh, distiller and engineer and designer called uh, Edward Adam, and then looking at column stills and then looking at pot stills. So kind of rather than the ascent of man, it's the ascent of, of distillation. Uh, so that's kind of where we're going to be going. But, you know, it all comes back to the pot still. So let's have a look at maybe a couple of really old pots, uh, again, from that French. Uh, shall, I, shall I just quickly show the overall path yes. that we're going to take? Yes. I, okay. I, I, didn't so want, that... I, I didn't want you to kind of, I was kind of trying to nudge you there, maybe. But anyway, yeah. yes, that's what we're going to be doing. So so the red line is column stills. The, the green line is batch distillation uh, pot stills. And then there's one at the very end, which is American, which is a bit of both. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing. So anyway, and let's have a look at the old pot. Now, when you think about pot stills, uh, really not a lot had changed. You know, if there was tweaks to pot stills, you know, there was uh, the cooling of the head, so an understanding if you cooled the head a little bit, if that was a little bit cooler, you would be able to get a, a better extraction going on. That was realised in the 1300s. The water bath, uh, which we see here on the left-hand side, uh, that was a, a, a creation round about uh, the 16th century. Uh, the worm tub uh, that then comes in uh, later on. But basically, I mean, somebody, they, they were a classic uh, porcine still, an old style still. You know exactly how that works. It's boiled up uh, in the pot, the vapour rises, it goes along the pipe, it arrives in the worm, which is immersed in, in some running cold water, it condenses back into spirit and you collect it. That is distillation. I think, Arthur, that if, if John French uh, was picked up by Doctor Who and shoved in the TARDIS, uh, and taken from the 16th century up to a distillery, actually a pot still distillery even today, he would understand exactly what was going on. So that was kind of how little had really been moved. They were kind of finessing in pot stills, and there's a reason for doing it, but not a huge amount of great innovation uh, was taking place until the late 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. So for a starting point, uh, let's start with uh, Peter Wolfe, uh, Wolfe was an Irish chemist, uh, an 18th century Irish chemist. 
hugely eccentric man, had breakfast at half past four uh, in the morning. <laughs> uh, and what Wolf developed an idea which was originated from Glaube uh, for chemical purposes of bubbling gas through water to extract solutions, uh, making things such as ammonia, for example. But this idea that you could bubble something through water and create something and, and passing it through vessel from to vessel to vessel uh, to, to create something from a chemical point of view was then adopted by distillers. So this is a, a scientific breakthrough. And this that particular design you will see repeated time after time after time uh, as we move through our story. Straight away, uh, it makes yeah. me think that uh, it's probably worth mentioning that the Pachin still that we've already seen and those stills of the water bath. I'm imagining that we, obviously we're looking at this from the perspective of alcohol and drinking alcohol and some of these stills would have been used for that but they would have been for all sorts of reasons and that those wolf bottles makes me think of that it would have been alchemic it would have been yep. chemistry it would have been distilling herbs for medicinal purposes waters and all those kind of yeah, things yeah, yeah, more yeah, yeah. than just uh booze uh, uh, absolutely you know you don't, you're perfect because i mean uh kind of jumping ahead a little bit you know but steam distillation you know, steam distillation is adopted by the drinks industry by in, in the tail end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Steam distillation for perfume had been used in Europe from the 12th, 16th century, and in France and in China uh, from the 7th century. You know, so yeah, I mean, it comes from perfume, it comes from medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but th this is the, the the drinks industry, the alcohol industry, becoming an industry rather than just being small-scale producers, maybe making for, for their immediate com community. Because this scientific breakthrough uh, of, of Wolf is then picked up by distillers. And you can this be applied to distilling at scale? And, and the way in which scale is achievable is the start of the Industrial Revolution, which is steam power. Uh, so there's a lot about steam power, all these patent books. You know, everything's about steam. Everything is about steam engines and steam looms and uh, steam uh, machines for making silk hats. And, you know, you know, it's steam, 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 steam. And the whole point of it is about trying to improve distillation and looking at flavour, to be perfectly honest, to try and isolate uh, specifically. Think about what distillation is. Distillation is about concentrating flavor and selecting flavors. That's what distillation is. It's not about creating flavor, it's about concentrating and selecting. And collecting all these different congeners, not just alcohol, but congeners, flavor compounds. And all of these flavor compounds will boil, will volatilize at different different points. They have different boiling points. So there are trying to, what distillers have always been trying to do from those early pots, distillers right up to today's distillers is to try and find a way of capturing specific ones, kind of stretching the spirit out to be able to find the flavours that you particularly want. Distillers understood, pot still distillers early on understood slower distillation produced a higher quality spirit rather than boiling fast to just get this kind of jumble of mess uh, and, and lots of off, off aromas. A slower distillation helped. And also this thing called reflux uh, began to be understood, which is that uh, mini distillation, a, a condensation that happens within the still itself, within the body of the still itself, so that it, the vapour turns back to liquid, falls back down, is perhaps split into two or three or four on the way back down, falls back down, is distilled. So a way of kind of purifying or extracting, separating specific aromas. Reflux is really important. Fractional distillation, I, 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 as, as it would be known. And you think of that as being a relatively new invention. Uh, let's have a look at Philip Ulstad's book from the 1530s. Uh, an amazing book. The, Fif the shift. 1530? I yeah, 1530. This is the shift. This is the shift from, from <laughs> alchemy, from the esoteric world of alchemy into uh, medicinal chem or chemistry from medicinal chemistry. Uh, that's a column still. That's a column still from the 16th century, uh, which is cooled by by water coils, and there are sponges uh, in the head, which were <laughs> which absorbed which absorbed phlegm, uh, and phlegm is 
what we would know as fusel oils, the unwanted uh, element mm. in that distillation. Boom. Nothing is new, <laughs> as, as I discovered. But if you can um, control reflux, you can control flavor. Uh, so that is the point. That, that is the whole point about this big shift in terms of innovation at the beginning of the 19th century. Building at scale, building in volume, but also perhaps behind the scenes uh, for some distillers, a way in which to separate specific flavors. Enter the engineer. Uh, Enter uh, Edouard Adam. Uh, Edouard Adam uh, was allegedly an illiterate uh, man from, from uh, Montpellier, but he had an extraordinarily analytical mind. I'm not saying he, he wasn't illiterate or he was illiterate, but he, he made a few enemies, so maybe they just spread, spread the, the word around that he was, in fact, uh, illiterate. Uh, but, you know, wolf bottles begat, you know, it's a bit like the Old Testament, wolf begat, salute, so begat Edouard Adam. Uh, and Adam attended uh, lectures talking about Saluzzo and Wolf's chemical bottles and began to think about distillation at scale. And he patents this still here that, that we're looking at uh, in 1801. Uh, and it's an extraordinary invention. And it's an, it's an invention which has been refined, but also repeated all the way through. There are stills which look like this operational today. And that's uh, back at the beginning of the 19th century. I'm going to try and uh, kind of vaguely work out uh, what, what's going on here. Or maybe I'll just describe it. I, I think it's fairly obvious what, what's happening. Arthur, you have to do the pointy bit. Uh, the thing on the left-hand side is your still. Uh, the, so the wine, this is the wine uh, distillery, uh, or distillation rather. Uh, the, the wine vapour uh, is, is released through heat. It rises up over the barely visible uh, swan's neck, and it goes into the first of these three eggs. These eggs are also half filled with the same wine. That alcohol stream arrives, the vapour boils, it increases in strength, it fractionates off, it rises up, it goes into egg number two. Same thing happens, it goes into egg number three, which is actually in a water bath, so some, some uh, elements reflux off, and then the vapor carries on. There's a further refluxing taking place in this strange globe. And then it goes into this uh, preheater, which is the top, uh, the top section of the worm, and then down into the bottom worm to be recondensed. There's lots of bells and whistles on, on this still uh, with vapor uh, moving in various directions and liquid moving in various directions. It's a very, very elegant design. Uh, the Ad Adam's eggs. Uh, you could add another egg on there uh, and make an even higher strength spirit. So the, the, the result was that even though this is a batch distillation, you are producing a higher strength spirit and you're finding a way to separate flavours. So essentially, that's what Adam is doing. Mm -hmm. But as we say, still a batch distillation. Yeah, yeah. So, um, whereas we're going to progress to something that allows you to distill continuously. But, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Because because the whole the whole the, the dream of the the dream of the distillery owner, the dream of the distiller, was for this kind of seamless flow uh, of uh, wash. Let, let's just call it wash coming in at one end and spirit coming out of the other in a continuous stream. It's about efficiency, you know. And this word is going to keep cropping up all the way through the talk. It's about efficiency. So. I'd like, first of all, to kind of look at that kind of evolution of what we what we know as the column still and continuous uh, distillation, because Adam begets Fournier, and Fournier events the column, and Fournier begets a man, a Belgian distiller called Célier Blumenthal. Uh, and Célier Blumenthal, uh, instead of, and him and Fournier, instead of working on that horizontal axis, which, uh, which Adam was doing, they flipped it onto the vertical. And instead of having the eggs, they had essentially what, what are kind of compressed uh, pot stills inside a column. And because the column was quite tall and because uh, the, these individual compartments, vapour could, could pass through them, it allowed uh, an extended distillation, more reflux, and therefore a different flavour of spirit coming out 
of the tail end. So that separation of the column into various different compartments is a major, major breakthrough. Kind of Adam, silly Blumenthal, you know, horizontal up to the vertical and extending it. And by extending it, helping to separate flavors that you want from flavors that you don't want, rather than doing it at the very end of the process. And wh where are we in time here? Sorry. But, sorry uh, yeah, Silly Blumenthal built his still 1808. Uh, the patent uh, was granted in 1813. So this is right at the beginning of the 19th century. And it's built and, and they're constructed because Napoleon, the emperor Napoleon, has given, uh, awarded a prize for people to design a still because he is planting our dear old friend, sugar beet. Uh, ah, and because he's building <laughs> sugar beet, we want to make spirit out of sugar beet or indeed from potatoes. Uh, can you design a still which is going to be doing this? So rather than relying on the old stills, here's a, here's a, a challenge to, to engineers and distillers to actually make something, uh, a new spirit, a completely new spirit. So, yeah, we're, we're right back to mango wurzels <laughs> again. We have to. There's always going to be mango wurzels uh, uh, some, somewhere in there. But it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, design. Uh, that, that design, which you flipped up, and we'll talk about in a little more detail in a second, was adapted by a Dutch sugar trader called Saval. Uh, and he then sold the patent to a man called De Ron. And there are, various, and there are variations, and Saval kind of, uh, improved uh, the, the original Sally Blumenthal uh, still, and there's variations of those, again, still working, particularly in the Caribbean. And just to kind of maybe kind of uh, quickly spin through uh, the, the engineering genius of, of this, actually probably forgotten still, certainly from a whiskey perspective, this is never really talked about. From a rum perspective, it's talked about, but from a whiskey perspective, it's never really talked mm. about. Uh, I, I don't know if, you, if you've got uh, the the slide to, to kind of bring up uh, of of this particular still, and I, I can I can I can talk you through it. The flat bottom still you talked about, or the no no the 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 Blumenthal still. The, the, uh, this one? No, 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 the previous one. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So if you if you see that that A at the bottom, uh, that that bottom boiler down there. So the bottom boiler down there is full of wine and the steam uh, injected into that, so steam driven still, that rises over that pipe into the base, into that pot at the bottom of the column and the alcohol vapours begin to travel up that column. Prior to that, there is a holding tank at the very, very top here, which isn't shown, and wine is passed down through that, that tube at the very, very top, down into that worm. That worm is flooded with wine the wine is risen up and it floods into that uh, that tube at the very top there uh, with, with kind of wormy stuff in it. That is full as well. And then the pipe will take that into the top of that bottom part of, of, of the column. So that begins to flow down. The vapour is rising up. And as the vapour, hot vapour, hits the wine descending, it's going to strip off the alcohol. The alcohol vapour is going to rise and the spent wine is going to fall down into, into the, the base of the still and can be drawn off. Saval, this is Saval still. Saval's genius was adding some more plates above that point, which have further rectifications, further purification. So again, that kind of up the lighter aromas, heavier ones reflux down, lighter, heavier, lighter, heavier, moving up, kind of, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down, until you hit that, that horizontal worm at the very top Again, there's going to be reflux taking in there, and the wine is going to be heated up, got it inside the pipe, and then into that worm, into that vertical worm, and uh, condensed and, and drawn off. Brilliant design. Absolutely yeah. brilliant design. Absolutely incredible. And to think that these are, you know, coexisting with pot stills. I mean, it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's incredible that they're such different inventions, but there's one camp and another camp that they're, they're like, to use them and immediately I can't help thinking about the engineering and manufacturing leap mm -hmm. to make that compared to that yeah. and, as, and especially compared to that which some yeah. people are effectively still using I mean yeah. so we're talking industrial revolution and the ability to 
uh, to cast metal in, in wholly new ways. This wouldn't have been possible 50 years ago, probably. No, no it wouldn't have been. And, and one reason that Adam stills, Adam, uh, Adam died penniless. You know, he, he, he didn't make a business out of this. And his stills kind of failed because he hadn't taken into account pressure. Uh, you know, and a lot of these stills failed because they hadn't take, taken into account pressure. So you needed, you know, the rivets popping all over the place. And it's interesting looking at, at all the patents which are coming out. And a lot of the patents are fine, are really quite small tweaks uh, and small pieces of equipment to help stills and, and various other uh, steam-driven equipment actually to work as, as it goes on. So th this is a, a, a modern industrial, a new industrialized society learning the new rules of the game. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's what I find fascinating about it because there are so many, there's this huge influx uh, of these ideas, adaptations from, from Wolf, adaptations from Adam, finding new ways to actually work out essentially the same principles. And the beautiful thing about that, 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 uh, that's still before we move on, uh, is that they're still used. You know, uh, you go to the French Caribbean, Saval introduced it to the Caribbean because he's a sugar trader. Uh, it goes into the Caribbean, into the French Caribbean, because of the French connection. Uh, it's not the film. Uh, and into, into <laughs> Guyana because of the, the Dutch connection in Guyana. Uh, and here, you know, I got a bottle of this uh, from the lovely people at St. James uh, just the other day. Uh, the new uh, Brou de Cologne, 74.2. Uh, 74, <laughs> 74. That is the still it's made in. Incredible. You know. It's still the same way, but right? when you go out there, so it's not all about steam. Anyway, mm -hmm. but, but kind of to come back to your your really important point there. Yes, it's the industrial revolution. You've got cheaper raw materials. You've got investigations into yeast. You've got the growth of cities. And you've got the growth of cities. You need more volume. Uh, you have the ability to create volume because of steam, but also you want this this need for efficiency. You want greater control, you want lower fuel costs, you want lower labour costs. All of these are factors within the design of these stills. And it was really interesting going through a lot of the early reports and looking at the how distillers in different parts of the world prioritised uh, all of these things. The rum distillers, uh, the potato and beet distillers making the brandy, American whiskey distillers as well, are prioritizing using less fuel and lowering cost. Uh, cleaner spirit would be a benefit, but wouldn't necessarily be the main driver. They knew it was happening, but it wasn't necessarily the main driver. It wasn't kind of, we want to make a bit of spirit. It's very different in Scotland at the beginning of, of, of the 19th century because of the flat-bottomed still. Mm. So they've gone from elegant engineering what? marvels to this. <laughs> <laughs> to probably one of the greatest disasters that ever hit the Scottish whiskey industry, the flat bottom still. So the 1787 Wash Act uh, taxed distillers, uh, lowland distillers, on still capacity. So the distillers went, right, how are we going to get around this? Because we will go bankrupt if we continue to produce from the stills that we're already, already using. And they built lots of really small stills with very broad bases with a very thin gauge of copper at the bottom, uh, which could be distilled in a matter of minutes. Therefore, although the tax burden was higher, they were making more spirit. Boom. Kind of a tax Can burden. I, is, is that a hand crack? Is, this, is it, that the size of this thing? It, yeah, they were tiny. They were really, really small sales. Uh, yeah, it was, I can't, it looks like a hand crank. You know, it, <laughs> they're, they're just like ridiculous. They're absolutely ridiculous. And they didn't work. Well, they distilled. But they made this burnt, in uh, 19th century terms, imprumatic spirit. And that helped drive illicit distillation. Because the stuff in the lowlands was so dreadful, there was a demand for pot still whiskey. But pot still whiskey by that time had been effectively criminalised, but there's a demand for the moonshine that drives illicit distillation. And you mm -hmm. go to the 1799 parliamentary report, and there are distillers and there are merchants complaining about spirit quality because, directly because of these stills. These stills are, are, are blamed. So if these large distillers had to survive and work financially, they had to find this new solution. So in Scotland, the drive was very much to improve spirit quality, as well as have efficiency, etc. Spirit quality uh, came up top. 
And you go, well, well enter, enter Steen or enter, some, uh, uh, enter coffee. No, enter uh, a vet, a French vet called Jean-Jacques Saint-Marc. And Saint-Marc was originally uh, a distiller of, of potatoes and beet in, in France. He moved a beet distiller. Hey, that's great. Hey, hip man. Uh, he moved over to London uh, also to set up a distillery to make uh, potato spirit and maybe mango or some spirit, who knows. Uh, and he was, he was kind of frowned on because the excise up until about the 1820s kind of frowned on anything that wasn't a pot still in, in the UK. So the UK was a little bit behind uh, the rest of Europe in terms of that. But by 1823... Uh, you, you see uh, St. Mark's still getting installed at Nicholson's uh, distillery. Uh, he, he, here's a, here's a, a quote about him, a uh, newspaper clipping about him sort of saying, I have got this new, new still. It has been patented. Uh, I, it is there to make patent brandy. And patent brandy in, in England was made from, from potatoes or, or ideally or, or beet. And then on that next slide, Arthur, uh, you see the installation of one of St. Mark's improved stills and the Nicholson Gin Distillery in London. And all the great and the good are there, uh, all throwing their hats in the air because here is a way to, to rectify spirit to a higher quality, which is going to help uh, create a, a better base for gins. So a forgotten genius, I, I think, St. Mark. You know, another one who, who died penniless, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and a really, really cunning design here, uh, which I'll, 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 I'll rattle through at a, a fairly uh, quick pace because I, I am kind of aware of, of time here. It is seven coppers which are placed on top of one another. Uh, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, moving up. Uh, copper one, which is the very bottom one, has to wash in it and a fire underneath. Uh, all the ones above are linked together. Uh, the up pipes are carrying vapour in an upwards direction. Down pipes are carrying wash. Four, five and six, so there's three ones on the top, have these kind of interesting domes uh, on the top. The wash is coming into number six. It floods that chamber, falls down to the number five, down to number four, and down to number three and down to number two. The bottom pot is 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 lit up. The vapor rises, and all the alcohol vapor begins to be uh, taken off. Number two, number three, as it rises up the still, when it moves from number three to number four, the vapor is actually carried into inside that dome, uh, and anything that's <coughs> any of the heavier components in there reflux out can be redistilled. Uh, the vapor is then carried up, and it goes into inside uh, that little. Uh, dome on number five, inside the little dome on number six, and then up through that sneaky pipe, again a little bit more reflux, and up that final line arm, again at an angle, more reflux to be condensed. So a very, very clever still. It, look, it looks complex. Did it break? What went wrong? It, it, it looks fizzy. It, it, it didn't work. His initial one was built for beet, uh, and, beet spirit, uh, and the liquor was very clear. Uh, he ran into problems when he was trying to use a grain, a grain mash, because the grain mash is thicker. And mm. as soon as the grain mash is thicker, then you're going to get sticking on plates, and you're probably going to get uh, some burning. Also, you had a direct fire uh, underneath there, so with no rummager, so it was it was going to stick. And what he did was actually adapt that still, and he adapted the still in 1827 for thicker matches, and that went into London, into Bristol, into Ireland, into into. Cork especially, uh, Carlo, Cork and Dublin. Uh, and his stills were also found in the Caribbean and also found in Canada as well. So yeah, right. so by and large, you know, Sam Mark, even though uh, as a man, he kind of uh, ended up once again bankrupt. Uh, you know, his, his own distillery failed in London. Uh, the, the secretary of the company ran off and left him with 50,000 in debt, which was a lot of money in those days. Uh, the stone design actually carried on uh, for a few years. Hmm. So Ireland, you mentioned, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you know, the, the history, uh, the true history of Irish whiskey is is now being written. Uh, mm -hmm. Cork, 
should be featuring as heavily as Dublin. Cork is the centre of, of innovation in terms of distillation uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and here you have uh, on, on our next uh, on our next slide uh, the, the rather the rather wonderful uh, Sir Anthony Perrier, and Sir Anthony uh, Perrier also invented a, a patent still. Uh, I'll crack through this very very quickly. Uh, those were that's a kind of the t figure one is is kind of a, a, a cross section side on of his plates. One of the plates and there'd be plates piled on top of. Uh, one another within a still. And the wash would come in, and if you go down to, to that figure number two, it passes all, all through this kind of labyrinth, uh, and that's heated from below, and any vapour will rise up and go up in, into the next labyrinth and then up and up and up and up, while anything that's refluxed off will fall, fall down, 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 and start start being uh, redistilled. So, you know, a, a pretty clever way of doing it, you would think, uh, it's quite beautiful in its own way. Mm. Uh, Morewood, Samuel Morewood, uh, Irishman, friend of Ineas Coffee, writes in 1838 about this. Uh, the method is not now practised. Uh, 1822, uh, this was patented. Uh, the method is not now practised, said uh, Morewood just over 10 years later. And although invincing considerable judgment and ability in the inventor, has not been productive of any eventual service worthy of further note, which is a very polite Victorian way of saying, sorry, pal, it didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Rubbish. Yeah. And, and Sir, uh, Sir Anthony Perry. Yes, he, he was the Lord, Mayor, the Lord Mayor of Cork, you know, so, yeah. you know, and, and a great benefactor to the city. Uh, and an interesting design, it just didn't work. And a lot of these just didn't work. Didn't work. Uh, in Scotland, meanwhile, uh, Robert Steen, uh, and this is kind of moving into known whisky history, uh, mm. installs a new double column. Double columns uh, have been been invented by this point at Kirkliston Distillery, but trials it in Dublin, uh, where apparently it was it was viewed by Aeneas Coffey, and this works on a very similar system. So the wash is actually sprayed into a series of chambers by um, uh, pistons. The, uh, the, the chambers aren't separated by copper, which they normally would be, but actually by hair cloths. Uh, that was the problem. Mm. So in this kind of steam-driven uh, atmosphere, uh, alcohol moving up, uh, refluxing taking taking place, but all the oils uh, would settle on the ho on the horse hair uh, separation. Uh. Uh, I said I sent some clagging might happen. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. And, yeah. I sent some clagging. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. everything clagged up. So it had to be turned off and everything had to be cleaned and everything had to be put back in. So although it was efficient in terms of fuel, it wasn't efficient in terms of actually making spirit. So but coffee apparently sees this. Uh that's what record records show. Uh and adapts it. I think looking at coffee still, uh what, what actually happens is that Coffee takes on board what Steen is doing, but Coffee, as an engineer, will have looked at other patent uh, stills. He will have seen St. Mark's stills using. He will understand what is going on uh, in Europe as well. Uh, and the Coffee still, which is a very elegant design, I think draws as much from those early French stills as it does from Steen's slightly botched attempt uh, to, to, to do a uh, column and continuous distillation. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk through this coffee still then? I mean, the people within whiskey will be fairly familiar. Let me put it. Yeah, yeah they did. Do you the, 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 the magic, the magic slide? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, yeah. So, well, that's it without. And then let's add, there we go, add some red there. Yeah. So, so basically, what's happening, the red is washed coming in. So, it's coming in from the left hand side, it's going through. Uh, that right-hand chamber, which is the rectifying chamber, in a pipe uh, all the way down, zigzag, 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 all the way down. And uh, you will find out that it's been heated all the way down for, for a very good reason. And then it rises up to the top of that, that left-hand column, which is the analyzer, and gets spread, sprayed onto the plate at the top and then zigzags all the way down. At the same time, Live steam is injected into the bottom of that analyzer column that is rising, stripping off the alcohol. 
the alcohol vapour is rising up, fractionating off, it's carried down to the base of the rectifier and it starts to rise again, again refluxing off at every single plate. And because it's very hot, it's beginning to heat up the wash, which is descending. It's a really clever way of doing it. And then that can be drawn off at actually whatever plate you want, depending on uh, what stamp spirit uh, you want to take. One of, one of the keys about uh, this, this form of distillation, uh, Saval did it as well and Steam didn't, was you can tap off so you can actually take off any of the unwanted alcohols uh, that you don't want, the faints effectively, mm -hmm. these oils, so you, you, you can tap off, uh, which is something that Steam didn't do. So it's a beautiful and elegant design uh, that, 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 that Coffee did. It's a brilliant piece of design, but it's not the only brilliant piece of design. That's my, that, that's my point. Fantastic. And so, I mean, Coffee is so famous. Did he? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, and, and the, what he changed for not just the whiskey industry, but other alcohol industries, mm. industries also, but in terms of the acquisition of duty, uh, of excise for not just Ireland, but the UK, you know, which is such a huge contributor to uh, the, the economy. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. An extraordinary... he, he changed society. I mean, did he? Yeah, and I, I think that this is the kind of thing that we, we kind of gloss over because that kind of production bit is over there and all the romantic thing is about is about smugglers or about or about the, the amazing blenders you know and you forget about the engineers who are in the middle yet the whiskey fundamentally shifts uh, at, at this particular point this is coffee's last chance you know i mean coffee was an excise officer he had had his skull fractured he'd been bayoneted twice he'd been beaten up he's a 50 year old man when he when he applies for his patent you know he's a man who's just retired who's going right this is my last chance and it was a poorly paid job that, that they had this is my last chance and so from ex excise officer to distiller it's kind of <laughs> gamekeeper turned poacher it's the other way around almost isn't hmm. it it's quite no but he, he he wasn't making it illicitly you know he was making, no, no, true, you know, true. <laughs> making it perfectly legally uh, you know that's that that's why he got his patent you know but even then he had to wait two years for it, for it to be approved and, but, and the other important thing about it is that, you know, history is written by the victors. And what you see in so many books still is that Ireland rejected the coffee still completely. Well, which this is yeah. not true. It is not yeah. true. <laughs> so um, just before I, I, I pull together some charts for you on this subject, um, but uh, I mean, coffee... He, he's not Sir Nears Coffee. Did he make his fortune? Did no. he? I mean, it, it was successful, but um, uh, the, was he financially the design, successful? Yeah, the design was successful. He did a distillery called Dock Distillery in Dublin. Uh, that failed in 1834 when I think the, the money man, the partner, died and he sold the distillery very soon after that. Uh, so it looks like you know the, the money ran out. Uh, he moved to England in 1839. Uh, set up business over there, transferred the business to his son, also called Ines, and the son sold up uh, a few years later uh, to John Doerr, who, who still has the, the the coffee the coffee name. Uh, so so no, it, it wasn't a huge it wasn't a huge success to be perfectly honest. Although everybody's heard his name, uh, you know, I, I've been trying to find find out where he was buried. I suspect uh, the graveyard because he lived kind of uh, in the east end of London. Uh, and you know, I, I think the graveyards have been built over, or or was destroyed in the Blitz, or or whatever. You know, there's no monument to Nias Coffee, and I think I think it's a real shame. It's a real shame. Mm -hmm. So I'm not knocking him at all. I think it's a beautiful design. Uh, what I'm saying is that there's a bigger picture. You know, th yeah. there's lots yeah. of things happening all around the world for different reasons uh, at this particular point. So quickly to just give you a wee break and, and cover the idea that. Uh, I, I'm sure I've repeated this myself, I don't know where it comes from, where I read it from, but the idea that, well, the Scots kind of beat the Irish in terms of whiskey for a long period of time because, ho, 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 the Irish were slow to adopt the coffee still, even though Aeneas Coffee was an Irishman, how short-sighted them, the Scots embraced it and took over the world. Yeah. But I, I found this document, again, Excise Report for House of Commons, uh, by my favourite bedtime reading, and here's just one, we'll leave that pie chart for a second, but here's just one 
uh, part of it that shows coffee's apparatus, coffee's apparatus. Here's another page as well, coffee's apparatus. This is all Ireland. She's apparatus we'll see, I think, later on very briefly. So again, as I like to do, I went through the entire report. I put this into pie charts. So up to the top left is uh, Scotland. So many more stills, uh, um, probably 30 or 40 percent more than Ireland and 10 coffee stills and just a couple of steam stills. Ireland, less stills, proportionally much higher and also 14 um, coffee. Uh, 14 coffee stills. England, they were all in on coffee. <laughs> uh, they were looking to <laughs> rectify. <laughs> so there, there was one pot still and 10, uh, 10 coffee stills. So yeah. I, I think that this story comes, um, because it's an easy story to tell, it kind of comes with a little bit of a gag in there as well. Um, but I think it comes because later on, uh, for a period of time, possibly they rejected the idea of uh, of, uh, of patent still whiskey. Certain key Irish distillers did, but certainly at the beginning they were they were quick quicker to adopt it. Yeah, and yeah. if we look at this graph, which maybe you want to jump in and explain, um, so top left, all of UK spirit. Um, uh, the red line is the patent or column still. England, um, uh, the same. That's the red line going up and up and up. And Ireland, well, and Scotland there. So I think that graph shows it fairly clearly, doesn't it, Dave? Yeah, it, it does. It kind of shows that, that decline that's taking place in Ireland. A lot of distilleries were cl closing around about that time. but And this stops at 1850. By the end of, of the 19th century, you will, you will see in terms of volume, you know, significant uh, volume. So although there are, there are fewer coffee stills, they are they are able to produce more whiskey. So th that essentially uh, takes over completely. I mean, 72% of the whiskey being made in Ireland at the tail end of the 19th century was coming from from, from patent stills, which were essentially coffee stills. Uh, and yeah. it changed but for a whole, whole variety of reasons. Something that I think we'll address in, in a future one, don't quite have the time to go into the actual sure. reason of it and DCL's scorched earth policy when it comes to Ireland, but <clears throat> but uh, the Irish whiskey story is not quite as simple as as we have been led to believe. Mm, it's really interesting, but as you say, we'll come back. So cracking on. Yeah, yeah, yeah cracking on here. So uh, what I would like to do now is look at what's happening in in batch distillation, in, in pot still distillation, because it's not been left behind. Uh, there is also there are also innovations uh, going on in here. And that started off just after Adam, or contemporaneous with, with Adam, with, with another French distiller called Berard. Uh, and Berard uh, essentially invented the, what we now know as a purifier, uh, which is used in a whole number of Scotch uh, distilleries. You know, uh, think about Glen Grant, for example, a good example of that. Uh, so you've got the, this uh, box, which is Im immersed in, in water, and any... Uh, any heavier elements uh, which are coming uh, will reflux out and can can get carried back into uh, back into uh, the body of the still. So a very very clever way of doing it. Uh, again, a batch process. So we like Berar. Uh, Berar was mm -hmm. good, but that wasn't quite the question that was being asked because pot still distillers liked the flavour of their spirit, but pot still distillers were also looking for efficiency. So they were thinking. They were saying, "Well, can we take this principle, and can rather than this kind of time-consuming, labor-intensive batch distillation of putting something in a pot, distilling it, collecting it, putting back in a pot, distilling it, splitting it into three, maybe doing it for a third time, can we actually get the same flavor of, of spirit, but just in one pass? How can we do it while still using pot stills?" Uh, so there's this kind of very kind of two areas of of investigation going in. Enter the retort still, which is still widely used in in the Caribbean. So a little drawing at the very top there is a very simple diagram of a retort. You have obviously the pot on the left hand side. Uh, the wash is in there. Uh, it rises up. The vapor rises up over the swan neck and into that first little pot there, which is the first retort. That normally will be filled with heads from the previous distillation or high wines. That will fractionate off. Greater strength, uh, different flavours get, getting released. That supercharged vapour rises up, goes into the next retort, 
which will normally be filled with, with tails. Uh, the same thing happens. It comes off and it can be then condensed and cut into three, into heads, tails, and that middle cut. So in that one pass from an 8% alcohol wash, you'll get a spirit of between 80 and 90% ABV. So really, really incredible way of, of, of making spirit. I, I, I love retorts. I, I'm a huge fan of retorts because you can change flavors. You can play around with flavors. Uh, you can fill, you can mix the heads and tails together. You can uh, dilute them to, to various levels. You would have to dilute them to various levels. That'll give different flavors. Uh, you can, the level uh, within the retort will also affect the reflux. That's going to affect flavor. Richard Seals uh, at Foursquare, which we saw on the left-hand side there, have cooling heads to increase uh, uh, the, the reflux uh, going on there. So lots and lots of tunes. Very, very, very clever piece of design. One on the right is Hamden. Uh, so there, you know, brilliant. And still used. And still used. And such weighty, characterful spirit as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, you, know, and, you know, and if you want to make a big funky Jamaican rum, you put dunder in the retorts and boom, uh, you're going to increase the ester levels. Uh, mm. You know, a new idea? Well, maybe not. <laughs> French. 1657, that looks like retorts to me, mate. <laughs> it really is. Uh, uh, what, what, what were they distilling? Uh, it's really wine? Good. I Yeah, it, it, it was wine. Uh, and I don't think it, it was being run in exactly the same way as the retort system. But the idea of linking pots together, you know, it didn't actually start with Adam at all. It was, it was already being used in the 17th century. There we go. Huh. But, you know, when you look at retorts, you, know, you go to Leonard Ray, a brilliant book called The Practical Sugar Planter in 1848, and he effectively, very politely dismisses coffee stills and uh, Blumenthal stills and says, you know, uh, for the planter, the pot and retort system is that the one which stands unrivaled. Uh, and if you're wanting to make that heavy style of rum, which was uh, certainly... The, the aim of Jam uh, Jamaican distillers, uh, the retort, pot retort system, uh, was the way to go. But, you know, the, the, the question that, that I, I, I've always asked, you know, being a huge rum fan, is why wasn't this used in Scotland? Uh, and then mm. I, I got this, uh, I got, uh, after one of the early antiquarians, uh, Pete Curry, uh, our old friend Pete Curry, uh, from from Duncan Taylor, who's now in California, sent me this, uh, which is Mr. Shand's patent rectifying still. Now, those of you who know uh, Pete and know you and Shand, I, I thought it was a joke to begin with. I, I thought this was you and Shand uh, had had invented it still, and it was it was a bit of a joke. But no, th this is actually true. And there you have uh, wooden uh, wooden uh, stills with copper tops. In a retort system, in in, in a link, what well, a linked pot system actually, rather than a retort system, uh, and that is coming from the eighteen twenties in Scotland. William Shan, uh, William Shan is a plantation owner in in Jamaica, so slaver. Again, uh, touching on a topic we, we looked at in the, the last series, he inherited his brother's uh, estate uh, in Fettercairn and began to do experiments uh, with stills at Fettercairn. Uh, with this and also in, in the Caribbean, probably Jamaica. Might be in Antigua, but probably Jamaica. It might have worked, but he inherited the state. He also inherited his, his brother's debts uh, and was bankrupted. So nothing happens. But the, the closest I see to that is the wooden pot still, which are still at the Diamond Distillery, which produced this rum, which we're drinking. So there we are. I'm just about to pour some, yeah. Yeah, it's kind fantastic, of elegant, heavy rum. Uh, people always ask, why don't wooden pot stills go on fire? And I say, there is this thing called steam. Yeah. Anyway, we're not talking about wooden wooden pots in Guyana, but there were retorts at Fettercairn, and there were also re retort elsewhere, because steam took out two patents. We always concentrate on that first patent, the column still that didn't work. And ignore this one. This is from 1828. And it's essentially uh, Adams still. But to quote Steen in the application for the patent, the object of the still being to cause a great economy in the consumption of fuel 
than to obtain spirits of any required strength in a single operation. This is all about efficiency. Uh, and if you look back to the records, and, and you flash that up uh, early, earlier on there, Arthur, uh, you see when, and when Barnard visits in the 1880s, there are two steam stills working in Cameron Bridge and Yoker. And, but there's also coffee stills as well. Uh, and Barnard says that in Yoker, one of the lower floors is one of, uh, has one of Steen's patent stills for the manufacture of malt whiskey, the same as that described hereafter at Cameron Bridge. And I wonder whether the Steen stills that he's talking about and which were installed there were actually the linked pot stills, the patent stills, rather than the failed uh, column still. And I asked uh, Alia at uh, Diageo Archive about this, and she <laughs> quite literally <laughs> answered just before, before we came on and, and included a, a really interesting document there. Uh, she was saying the link pots seems to have a reasonable theory to me, but I'm afraid I don't think we have proof either way, which is a very, very sensible thing for a proper historian to say rather than somebody who just like jumping in. Uh, which myself, but she did include very kindly uh, an account of uh, what Cameron Bridge was like in 1877. And in that, the and I'm sorry, I, we didn't manage to get a slide of this, uh, what this, man, this gentleman called James Berry, who was a member of staff in 1877, said, we're making 25 to 36,000 gallons of whiskey per week, comprising oh. grain, flavoured malt, silent malt, and pot still, in which operations of three types of stills were employed, viz, coffee still, steam still, and pot still. So flavoured malt. Yes. <laughs> that, kind of, <clears throat> that kind of leapt out at me as well. So uh, I think plain malt is essentially kind of like, like neutral spirits, so still to high strength, so probably a, a malt. Uh, malted malted barley base, but still to high strengths, a plain spirit. Flavoured malt, who knows? Uh, maybe that's the steam patent, uh, patent still. We don't know, but I'm going to keep digging on that one. So, yeah, hot off the press, folks. <laughs> Briefly on steam, I mean, we've all, yeah. we're all getting our favourite stills in, the, in, this, in this really amazing episode. This is not my favourite still, and it's barely an invention. He's just got a pipe and stuck it from one to the other still, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's taken, he's crudely adapted Adam, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he simplified Adam. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you wonder if, if, if how efficiently it, it would have worked. It seemed to be pretty hard on Steen here, but uh, I, there we go. Uh, just to, to, to kind of finish that, that thing off about Scotland is that the other innovations that took place in pot stills were really in still design. So purifiers, say at Glen Grant, flat top stills at Craig and Moore. Uh, and I sent that uh, shand apparatus up to Daz Haldane at White Mackay, because uh, it was interesting in terms of uh, fetter care. And he responded and sent me back this shot of the inside of the small spirit still at Dalmore uh, when it was replaced. And lo and behold, there in the neck, we have lots of tubes, lots of kind of reflux tubes that are sitting there. Uh, old, old design, which, which they really hadn't realised was there. Um, so there were innovations taking place in Scotland. They just didn't uh, adopt the, the retort system. Mm -hmm. And she, you didn't um, mention she. Yeah, that uh, much, she but that's... Uh, I, I, again, uh, Cork, Cork Distiller, uh, he had his own distillery, uh, the Green Distillery. Uh, it linked pots again, very, very convoluted way of, of working. It essentially didn't actually work, didn't produce particularly brilliant spirit and kind of was dropped fairly soon after. Uh, sadly, we don't really have time to explain exactly what was going on because we are uh, running over. It's well, like, I apologise uh, for people who haven't had that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyway, how many pen penniless still designers have we described already? Oh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I, I, I can't. I don't think many people made a huge amount of money. I think Saval did because he was a, a you know Saval probably ends up being being the one who, who ended up ma making money. Uh, John Doerr probably did as well, but but uh, mm -hmm. hardly anybody else did. Uh, there, there's a couple more pots, uh, but before we kind of move on to the final section uh, and kind of the beginning of what we would now know as the as the hybrid still. Uh, so you think about uh, Christian Carl stills. 
Vendome stills, etc. Uh, they're coming back to uh, kind of refinement on Corti's design, which is on the left-hand side. That was 1818, which was then improved by Shears, who was a Bankside coppersmith, also made gin stills, which are still working. Uh, and he he improved on, on the Corti patent in 1830. And in both of them, uh, what is happening is you've got the wash boiling up and in these little chambers uh, uh, on the, the on the Corti still, there's cold water running on the, the exterior, which is causing the reflux. It's also partial vacuum going on there, and that is then get, getting carried over. It looks remarkably like the the still at Brewdog, actually. And in the mm -hmm. Shears one, uh, the water is actually in that shaded area in the neck there. So cold water, again, the hot vapour hitting it, reflux coming back down uh, into the pot and then carried through uh, that that thing which looks like a pot still is actually just a preheater uh, for, for preheating the wash and then off to be condensed. So essentially a hybrid still. Clever. Very, very clever. Yeah, really, really clever design. And uh, Ray liked them. Yeah, Leonard Ray went, yeah, the, these ones actually work. But not all stills worked. Uh, and before before we kind of go move on finally to, to America, I just wanted to show a couple of my favourite stills which didn't work. Uh, this was uh, Miller's patent still from uh, from Glasgow. Uh, at the I, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know exactly when it was. I think it's in the middle of the looks like the middle of the century. Uh, and inside there, this is like a mad, mad reflux still. Uh, so the vapour would rise up the inside of the still as per normal, move over the the line arm into this kind of pre condenser. Uh, or two lots of precondensers there. Anything that's refluxed uh, on that carried back in that tiny little thin pipe, and it moves into this kind of helter skelter, which sits inside the still itself. So separated from the main compartment, it's in the skin between the exterior of the still and the interior of the still, and it kind of cascades down there like a, like a kind of luge. Uh, and is carried down into the base of the still, but also will fractionate off. Uh, and the vapours will go through this kind of cucumber thing and into the worm, but also it can be refluxed back. So there's movement left, right and centre in this still. I, I think it's so beautiful. beautiful. I think it's utterly beautiful. <laughs> Clearly, totally impractical. There's nobody actually installed one. But, you know, I, I challenge I challenge anyone from Harriet Watt or any, any new distiller. Miller's design just perfect Miller's design. Amazing. Um, <laughs> so from the, the beautiful and sublime to the rather ridiculous. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the most absurd uh, still, uh, which I found was from Mr. Evans. Uh, and this is the 1820s, uh, 1828, uh, that this came out. And the wonderful kind of uh, the Journal of Arts and, and Patent Inventions uh, says uh, Evans uh, this still design was not the result of the wild speculations of a mere theorist. I leave you to be the judge of that, Arthur. Uh, if you have, think back to those those uh, flat bottom stills, and the problem was yeah. the wash sticking and burning the imprimatic uh, flavour. And the answer to that was was the rummager. You know, so you, you have a rummager going around, and it cleans the still and it stops anything sticking. Evans had the brilliant idea of instead of something going round in circles, uh, cleaning the still, why not rotate the still itself? So this is our <laughs> still. So, so the still rotates over a fire. Uh, the vapour is released and it goes into this, uh, again, a kind of pre-condenser, which also rotates. So everything's spinning around. And some reflux stuff goes back into the still and anything that isn't goes into, into the final worm. Uh, you know, madness. Utter, utter madness. Uh, and, and the journal kind of finished saying, uh, upon the whole, great credit is due to the inventor for the ingenuity of his improvements, which, however, we do not consider as quite original. <laughs> well, you know, I disagree. I think it's hugely original and barking mad. <laughs> yeah. Spit roast whiskey didn't catch on, clearly. <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's another, here's another <coughs> fun one. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're kind of kind of moving on here on to uh, this is a log still. So we're moving on on to America here. <coughs> Sorry, uh, we drink of water. I'm too excited. Yeah, well, you've got a crocodile on your head. I'm a not crocodile, man. 
I mean, what's happening, just to get a quick kind of recap there, what is happening in in the Caribbean is that all the way through the 19th century, you're seeing new varieties, of new flavors beginning to be introduced because of these new stills. So in Cuba, for example, new technology for sugar making, new technology for distillation. They didn't bother with pot, they went straight into hybrid stills and column stills. Light rum is born. Uh, Saval stills are being used in the French islands and also in Guyana. You've got straight pots and you've got pots and retorts and you've got retorts for high end. So rather than rum being essentially variations on one theme, which it was at the beginning of the 19th century, by the end of the 19th century, you have, thanks to all these innovations, a vast array of different flavours taking place. And the same thing is happening in, in whiskey in Ireland and Scotland. You have pot still distillation and you have this new spirit coming out, which is, and I would argue, as the century moves on, less about driving spirit quality and more about efficiency and scale. Mm -hmm. And you can see this kind of existential crisis that begins to build up at the tail end of the 19th century with malt distillers going, is this actually even whiskey? You know, yeah, this is definitely. what we've made. This is what we've always told, we've always been told, even by the excise, was whiskey. How come this is whiskey as well? And you get, uh, you know, the 1908 commission, you get the truths of whiskey written by Dublin pot still distillers. So, you know, you're getting an increase in, in flavour, but you're also getting a challenge to people's perceptions and conceptions of what actually whiskey is. But without these innovations, you wouldn't have blended whiskey, for example. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now. But, you know, it wasn't just plain sailing. You know, there was a lot of kind of, are we doing the right thing here? Is this the right thing to do? You know, or do we call it a completely different spirit? So in rum and whiskey, uh, it's it's an area of, it's a century of innovation. There's a century of debate as well. Yeah, and it's it's an episode for the future that we should return to, but it's a really interesting and visible culture war that people are talking mm. about. You know, even that evocative name for the patent still whiskey, the column still whiskey, yeah. silent spirit, spirit, yeah. you know, it, it just tells you that it um, that, that, that there is less there as perceived by other yeah. people. Because, because essentially, essentially what's happening in column distillation, you know, it's taken to its logical extreme with vodka. What's happening in column distillation is removal of flavour uh, mm. that, that, that you don't want. You know, the more efficient it became in separating flavour, the more you could strip away. So you were left with essentially pure alcohol. So you can kind of begin to understand uh, where the pot still distillers were coming from. You know, th this is what they were making. This is what everybody has understood what whiskey is. And this newcomer suddenly comes along making vast quantities of spirit. But should you be called uh, by the same name uh, as we have been? You know, I, I fully understand where they were coming from. And it was a very visible debate as well that was spoken about a lot in newspapers and many, many people would have been aware of it. And it's strangely obf obfuscated now by the yeah. idea that some people think blend, oh, okay, it's not as good as single malt, but, you know, that's a, not, not, not an accurate argument. But there is a very different ingredient hiding within blended whiskey, and it's not because it's a mixture of distilleries, but very, very few people outside those engaged in whiskey and loving whiskey as a hobby kind of actually realize it but it's two very different drinks it's right, very different drinks i'm a huge fan of green whiskey you know don't get me wrong mm, I love it. And, yeah, and yeah. this one from thompson brothers our sponsors is utterly utterly delicious uh so i'm a huge fan a huge fan of it i just don't think it's been explained properly uh, as a different no, I agree. And, and it's hard to understand because you go to a grain distillery if you're ever allowed into a grain distillery and it's hard to understand what's happening inside you know uh, but you know, as much care is it, it, made to, to to create to create and actually still capture flavour in green whisky, but it's a different beast. It's a completely different beast. Absolutely. And if we come back to the Tim Vergon from Thompson Brothers, there are flavour parallels with rum yeah. and bourbon, and because of the equipment that it is made of, as well as ingredients differences. As well. and, and, and for me, Invergordon is the especially older Invergordon is the rummiest mm. of, of all the all, all the Scottish grains. Mm. Anyway, We've still got a crocodile on our head. Mm. Yeah, so so we're moving over to America because America is doing things differently. So France does things differently. Continental Europe, Germany, Scandinavia, France, 
different distillation systems uh, operational there, pots and different types of columns. Scotland, Ireland and England, but less in England uh, as that begins to decline. They've adhered to pot stills and coffee stills, essentially. Caribbean doing its own thing. America, North America, so that's America and Canada, doing their own thing as well. So it's not coffee is taking over the world. And they've got their own kind of mad innovations taking place in America. Uh, and there's a great book by by Hall uh, 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 called The Distiller's Guide, uh, 1818 uh, in America, and in which he says, the flat bottom Scotch sales won't suit us. Uh, our object is to do the greatest quantity of work in a given time with the least expense to labour and fuel. Efficiency is driving the driving force. He's also incredibly rude about French distiller. But, uh, I, 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 I won't necessarily <laughs> nauseate it by the flattery of French philosophers. <laughs> it's wonderfully xenophobic. Uh, and so th th there was Hackley's still, which uh, was, was like pot uh, in there, uh, and wooden. Uh, so they're made from wood. Uh, so stills in America are made from wood, or the exteriors are made from wood. It's going to be copper inside, obviously. Uh, why wood? Because it's lower cost, because it's widely available, and it's actually more durable than copper as well. Which moves us to, to the crocodile on my head here, which is from uh, the very beginning of the 19th century. This is Gillespie's Colombian independent log still. Uh, useful, it says, where there are logs. Uh, that's good. And that was taken up by distillers in Kentucky and Tennessee. So you have wash uh, on the extreme left-hand side. You get steam, uh, a kind of steam driver in the middle. Uh, and then moving into these three chambers, these three link chambers. We've seen all of this before. And the little kind of plank on the top is actually the condensing system. I suspect a second distillation would probably be needed from, from that particular log still. But log stills are widely used uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, and also in Canada, uh, there was a, a, a wooden stills uh, operational in Canada as well. But for me, the, the most important still, the most important kind of innovation in distillation, and which is unique to, to North America, is the three-chambered still, uh, which also was wooden framed. So uh, let me try and explain what happens in the three-chamber still. I'm, I'm indebted to uh, Chuck Cowdery and Dave Wandridge and the amazing Boston Apothecary website. If you haven't... Uh, logged into Boston Apothecary and you're interested in, I mean, uber geeky stuff, uh, it's the place to go. So I'm indebted to, to, to them for helping to explain this uh, and to Davin as well. Uh, oh, okay, so three chambers and the bottom chamber is full of uh, spent wash from the previous charge. Uh, that can then be drained off and used as sour mash. When that is drained off, the partially distilled wash in the second chamber, the middle chamber there, is dropped down into the bottom chamber. The, what is in the top chamber moves into the middle chamber and there's new wash coming in to fill up the top chamber. Live steam uh, is uh, pumped in and the alcohol vapours rise through uh, the bottom chamber into the middle chamber and then into the top chamber as well. And it can be held uh, for as long as the distiller wants. So you can actually begin to play some tunes uh, in terms of uh, level of, of wash uh, and also the, the duration of that interplay between vapour and, uh, and wash. So that was up to the individual distiller. Uh, the vapour is going to be rising up the very top into that kind of line arm into what's called there the low wine chamber, uh, which is effectively a, a doubler and that's filled with heads and tails uh, into condenser. Uh, anything, some will reflux back off, some the heads and tails can be diverted into that low wine tank and the heads condensed and drawn off uh, as product at the very end. So uh, the spent stuff in the low wines goes into the beer still and the fresh stuff, the fresh heads and tails, go, goes up into the doubler. 18 runs a day. Uh, so making a lot, huge tail run, not a very efficient uh, still at all. Uh, so Not efficient. Okay. Yeah, 18 runs would make up sufficient charge for the redistillation in the pot still the day after. And this is widely used for rye whiskey. It's not used for bourbon. It's used for rye whiskeys. It's very much uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, 
and also in Canada, so Hiram Walker and some Guterman Warts uh, had, had a three chamber column still uh, as well. And so pre prohibition, like pre prohibition so era. Pre prohibition era effectively died away. You know, as soon as distillation stopped in uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania, it disappeared. Continued in Canada, however. You know, it certainly mm -hmm. good reports and hide and walk for, for, for a good few years. They filled their, their stills uh, with rocks, uh, which helped to. <laughs> you know, it was bizarre. You know, I remember going around the distillery with Davin and being told about the rock filled stills. You know, it's just like, what the hell is going on? Here? And I've tried a few very old whiskies, but I've never tried pre-prohibition rye or this, you know, this Maryland rye. Have you ever tried any of that? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have a, a memorable evening. Oh, I can remember most of the evening in a bar called uh, Rogan's Tavern in of Osaka, of course, uh, which has, you know, the largest selection of bourbon, especially pre-prohibition bourbon and rye that I have ever seen in my life. Uh, wow. In the evening. <laughs> Sounds great. And was it good? <laughs> it, was, yeah, it was really good. And it was big. It was big. It was bold. Mm. It was mm. powerful. Uh, and you can understand from, from that sort of still, you're not going to get a, a, a hugely refined spirit, but you're going to have a spirit with guts. The only one which is now operational has been new, newly made by the amazing Todd Leopold, uh, Leopold Brothers in, in Colorado, Colorado uh, yeah. who has essentially looked at all the old plans and constructed a brand new three chambered still because he wants to see how it works. Uh, that's one spirit I would really, really love to try, that pre prohibition Maryland rye, you know, cut it with a knife and spread it with butter, kind of <laughs> super thick stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, so so this is where we get, yeah, this is where, yeah. We, yeah, um, yeah, this, where we so, so, yeah the, the, here are the options for the American distiller at, at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, on, on the left-hand side there, you have your three-chambered still, and on the right-hand still, uh, right-hand side, uh, essentially what you're going to be seeing at most most bourbon distilleries, uh, that column, the beer stripping column, uh, and the distillate moving into the doubler, uh, which essentially is is a pot still. Uh, uh, there you have kind of uh, American American distillation. And, and 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 for me, for me, kind of in conclusion, really, because I'm kind of aware of time here. Uh, oh, don't worry, it's been brilliant. That, that you know, the, the 19th century was this, unbelievable explosion Incredible. of creativity of problem solving of risk taking of testing out theories uh of of looking for efficiency you know some people just driving for efficiency and volume some people going what about quality what about spirit quality and there are so many names and there's so many forgotten names a lot of it, and we look at all the ways in which all these stills began to develop and were adopted by, by different spirits, a lot driven by raw material. You know, a still that was suited for wine wouldn't necessarily be a still that was suited for, for thicker matches. You know, so you can see why different, different developments took place uh, all, all, all around the world. And you begin to see, uh, and again, I, I would love to, to, to address the, this in a future episode, the flavour element and that tension that begins to build between flavour and efficiency. And, you know, you look at the, the current debates uh, within certainly the Scotch whisky uh, market, it's about flavour and efficiency. You know, this is not a new debate. This is starting in the 19th century, uh, all about that. But this is the century where decisions were made. And, you know, you look at you look at the forgotten histories of, of whisky, and you did that brilliant, brilliant uh, episode uh, on the forgotten women of Scotch whisky, and you think about what we know about nineteenth-century distillers, and we know about distillery owners, and we know about the blenders, but they wouldn't have been able to do anything without the engineers. And we only ever hear about mm. we might hear about steam, but this is happening all around the world. So it's kind of it's high time the engineers were, were actually given the credit that they deserve. I think because you know I, they, 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 this could be a multiple episode. <laughs> you know, because there are so many stories uh, to be to be teased out, uh, and it, it triggers so many thoughts. I mean, you think of Britain's uh, access to coal, therefore steam power, how that's linked into the industrial revolution, how we're formed with it, this whisky industry is formed within that context, and also this crazy combination. You know, from but in fact, you've got a still a composite here of some modern stills. 
Um, but if we just yeah. focus on that pot still, uh, middle, middle top right, you know, to this in mm. 100 years, yeah. but with them all coexisting. I mean, it makes me think of human origins and, and Neanderthals with, uh, with modern humans coexisting and, and human evolution being less like a tree, more like a shrub. There's all these things happening at exactly the same time yeah. and coexisting. And some seem absolutely space age and some seem stone age. Yeah. Wood <laughs> and, and the pot still so basic, and it you know comes back a bit to the Thompson yeah, it, who... it, it, It's absolutely extraordinary, sort of parallel, uh, you know, all, all these different patterns of evolution. You know, there's kind of a, an ecology of stills, really, that, 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 that we can talk about. Uh, I, I, I was going to say that uh, obviously, I didn't go into massive technical detail uh, about these simply because there's so many to try and compress or indeed distill shall we say, in, 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 into uh, the allotted time. Uh, if you are interested in, in asking some questions, I might be able to answer them. Uh, just uh, pop some some comments uh, on the YouTube channel or indeed on Facebook or, or whatever, and I will do my best to, to answer them because I know this is a huge sub subject and there's probably some some uh, wonderful geeky questions uh, which uh, we haven't, uh, haven't been able to answer. Uh, well, so it, 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 it's a suggestion. Yeah, here's a suggestion if you're, uh, that I'm going to spring on you. If you're up for a quick 15 minutes after this ends, there's actually been quite a lot of questions. Mm. Um, I'll keep this backstage link live with you. Yep. We can yep. chat about it and answer some of them because yep. we've had loads of great comments, people, you know, mentioning the equivalent of obscure B-sides um, <laughs> when it comes to stills, ones I've never heard of and you've not even I, 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 I'm a great digger of stills. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But before we finish, I, I think my favourite comment, I've just been keeping a weather eye on them, is this one. I, it must be talking about our rotating still. You hold the light bulb. I'll turn the <laughs> house. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if anybody can that's a, you can. You know. <laughs> that's the kind of logic. Dave, I've learned so much. This has been absolutely fantastic. We could have gone on for two, three hours, as with most of our things. Um, but, Ooh, um, uh, yeah, so uh, we'll finish this up. Um, but um, you and I will we'll, we'll hop on and, and type out the answers to a few questions on the um, Facebook and YouTube, if that's okay, Dave. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, looking forward to it. And have a wee bit more of a drink. Okay, thanks so much, Dave. See you next time. Not sure what the next time is. See you yeah. for Series 3 or Series yeah. 2. Part 2. Yeah, we're hoping for a couple of other episodes uh, that we will now go away and research. One thing we are finding out is that research is time consuming. So we're giving ourselves a month each to put together an episode and... Um, and we hope to return at the end of February. Yeah, some cracking ideas, so. <laughs> we have, yeah. Um, cheers, Dave. Thanks so much. I've really Thanks, Arthur. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks for watching. Cheers.